Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen, Executive Director of the Government Accountability Project. In a few minutes, a conversation with the man who blew the whistle on the Pentagon's fatal tardiness in deploying vehicles in Iraq that could withstand attacks with IEDs, improvised explosive devices. But first, Barack Obama was swept into office on a wave of public revulsion over a secretive and unaccountable Bush administration. Candidate Obama pledged change we can believe in. Has he delivered? To answer that question, we turn to Meredith Fuchs, General Counsel of the Non-Governmental National Security Archive, and Patrice McDermott, Director of OpenTheGovernment.org. Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. Well, let's start with a letter grade for the Obama administration to date. First you, Meredith. How are we doing on transparency? Well, sadly, I think it's still an incomplete at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Very good on rhetoric, not so great on some individual decisions. And so I think we're still waiting to see if it gets any better. So you don't want to give a grade yet? <laughs> no. Okay. No commitment. I think I would give them a B minus to a B. I think there are real issues with sorts of executive power uh, issues that they've been dealing with. but they have been making real changes in the agencies and on regulatory issues and they have begun reaching out more to the public on policy issues and having more or less successful fora uh, in that area so I, I would give them a B minus to a B. Okay well let's begin with the Troubled Assets Relief Fund, the TARP program. Right. The Inspector General for the TARP program recently came out with a rather scathing report on transparency problems regarding right. it. Can you talk about that? Well, it's interesting to compare the stimulus program and what we call the bailout because the stimulus, for instance, has some transparency, maybe not perfect, but some transparency built in. With the bailout, the TARP program, it's partly Congress's fault. Which is about the banking industry. Yes, it's about the financial industry. Uh, it's partly Congress's fault because they only required reporting to them. They didn't require reporting to the public and they seem to have an assumption that if the government reports to them that takes care of the problem and, and if there's no follow through then it doesn't take care of the problem and also there's no opportunity then for the public to hold both, or both uh, branches accountable. So yet there are, are serious problems. There are problems with what you know, the amount of information that the Treasury reveals, um, the timeliness of it. There are certainly problems with what the Fed, the Federal Reserve, uh, reveals. You know, you get aggregate data from them, but we don't know who they're giving the money to and how much and the details of how it's being used. So it, it's a problem both with the administration but it's, it's essentially a problem with the legislation. Well, and just so we don't miss this, right. and, uh, we don't bury the lead here, you're saying that uh, we don't know who the money is going to? No, in terms of the banks uh, that the Fed is, is giving money to, the Treasury, the Treasury money we know who it's going to, the Fed we know who they are, but we don't know what they're getting. So we, we get this aggregate information, but there's no way to, to dig down into it. Some organizations, you know, go in and do biographies of the banks that are getting it. But it, it's very high level abstract information. So we can account for some of it, but not nearly the same way that they're trying to do and we're with talking the stimulus. About, and we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars yes. again. Yes, yes. Uh, so your organization has launched some kind of effort to uh, sure. provide more transparency right. in the absence of the government doing so. Tell us about it. OpenTheGovernment.org uh, created and maintains a site called BailoutWatch.net and we put up all the news that's not just gossip uh, about all of the aspects of the bailout, not just TARP, but all the small business stuff and the automakers and everything. Uh, information about hearings, uh, you know, reports that are being put out. We're also, we also have been trying to get a expert exchange page going, sort of where people come in and give ideas and then blogs get going about them. So uh, we welcome ideas from your, your public. <laughs> All right, let's turn to Meredith a little bit yeah. on, on more on national security issues. <coughs> Is there good news on national security issues and transparency in the Obama administration? 
Well, I mean, I think it's what I said earlier. It's, it's unclear because it, the, the signs go both ways. On the one hand, for example, the Obama administration decided to release memos justifying enhanced interrogation or torture techniques, which was a tremendous advance in, in terms of transparency. On the other hand, they taken steps to prevent the release of pictures of detainee abuse in Abu Ghraib. And so you have the sort of the pro and the con when dealing with a specific incidence of possible wrongdoing. I mean, the same thing has happened with um, respect to state secrets privilege, where there's been sort of positive rhetoric coming out of the administration and an effort to review the policy on state secrets privilege. That's a privilege which allows um, the government to basically say that something is secret and it was used by the Bush administration to shut down um, lawsuits brought against the government. So what happens is the government walks into court and says this is a state secret and the judge uh, can't even say, well, I'll look at it in private? Well, the judge has some ability to find out what the secret is, but essentially the way the law works, um, the judge doesn't have much ability to do anything if he agrees that there's a state secret. And what's happened in the lawsuits, and it's because of the types of lawsuits that we're talking about that it matters, which are cases where people claim they were swept up, they were rendered away to some foreign prison and tortured, or cases where people say the government illegally surveilled them. Um, in those instances, the, the Justice Department argued that the whole programs are secret and so nothing could happen. And th that's the kind of cases, and even though there's been some positive rhetoric in the actual cases where this is brought up, um, the government has continued to advance the same policies of the Bush administration, Justice Department. Well, how about on the question of classification of documents? A lot of people were critical of the Bush administration for overclassifying, oftentimes investing um, uh, political appointees uh, with the authority to act on fiat, essentially, uh, without going through the uh, proper process in order to get a document declared classified. Uh, is the Obama administration any different? I think that there's good signs there. I mean, I think the release of the torture memos, which were classified records, um, is an example of that. And in addition, there's been a review started by the Obama administration that's currently underway looking at the classification system. And it has had, had unprecedented opportunities for public involvement in that, for the public to give their ideas. So these are good signs. Um, you know, at the end of the day, and that's why I said in, it's incomplete, we need to see what is the, right. the, what are the reforms that come out of this process. And then we need to look down the road a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, and see, in fact, how is it implemented. And one thing that did change, changed back uh, to a prior policy, was the presumption regarding uh, the release of documents requested under the Freedom of Information Act. Can you talk about that? Sure. Well, again, I think it's an example of good rhetoric and a good policy, but not playing out the way people had hoped it would play out. Um, in cases, litigation brought under the Freedom of Information Act to get information, the government hasn't changed its positions at all, even though its new policy is that when there is discretion, they will release information. It may be that in the future we're going to see the Obama administration's release practices are better than the Bush administration's, but we're not there yet. We can't judge it. But I, I have heard from various organizations and anecdotally that some organizations, some individuals, but mostly organizations, have had agencies on their own go back and review their decision and decide to release more documents. It's not the prevalent mode at the moment, but I think that the rhetoric has an impact in the agencies, and I think that it is incomplete. Right. I mean, the truth is the agency personnel, most of them are very happy to have a more permissive policy. <laughs> I mean, we asked for emails, or not for emails, but for re responses under FOIA <laughs> to the new FOIA policy, and we got emails from agencies that said, this is great. We're so excited that we can now have better practices to release more information okay. to the public. So I think it's very possible that this is Now, your organization changed. recently had success in getting the release of interviews with Saddam Hussein under the Freedom of Information Act. And these were interviews conducted by the CIA, I guess? By the FBI, the actually. FBI, and uh, they revealed some very interesting things, I think, that most Americans didn't really think about as a motivation for the behavior of Iraq 
uh, when we were threatening to invade because of weapons of mass destruction. Could you speak to that? Sure. It's interesting. Uh, the, the press uh, coverage focused on the fact that Saddam Hussein took the position that he it was more important for him to keep Iran in the dark about his um, inability, frankly, to use weapons of mass dis destruction than it was to let the United States know there were no weapons of mass destruction. And that's really what the press picked up on. And I actually got many responses from, from people who thought this helped validate our decision to go to war. But interestingly, I, I think that it raises much more mm -hmm. complex issues about the failure of our diplomacy and the failure of our intelligence that we didn't understand that's what was going on with Saddam Hussein. And to get back to your early question about transparency versus secrecy, the effect of his lack of transparency was his country got invaded and occupied. Very interesting <laughs> point. Good point. Um, one area that the Obama administration says it's making progress mm -hmm. um, is in uh, controlling uh, the uh, behavior of lobbyists and making sure that that is open and, and that people can see what's really going right. on there. Uh, is there an improvement in that arena? I think that there has been some and I, I think sort of on the flip side of that, it was a good thing the other day that they backed off their policy of not letting lobbyists speak to government people about the stimulus program. Um, but no, I think, you know, there are starts in that direction. Honestly, the Obama administration has taken a hard line against lobbyists, and that's because the term lobbyist has right. taken on this sort of demonic right. <laughs> um, meaning almost in, in this city. The reality is that there's pros and cons to that perspective. The fact that someone is called a lobbyist doesn't mean that they're doing bad work. Um, you know, many people lobby to advance very important public right. interest goals. So I think that the Obama administration, while taking a strict line, may have to in the future adjust a little bit to address the reality that there's a wide range of types of lobbyists, many of whom do very useful work. Yeah, a good example of that is um, Ella Miller Sunlight Foundation, who was a registered lobbyist, even though she doesn't do much lobbying, and she unregistered because uh, under the previous rules on the stimulus, she couldn't talk to anybody in the agencies about what was going on. So yes, I think... Um, I so think this effort to become more transparent could lead p the, to the opposite effect. Well, I think there's... They have taken it, I think, to an extreme, but on the, on the other side, they're not being transparent because they uh, stonewalled on the list of people who came to visit uh, the White House about the health care issue. And the Secret Service is saying that White House logs are not subject to FOIA. And they relented and gave a list of people to Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. But so they're, they're making it hard for lobbyists to engage, or who are called lobbyists. Um, but then they're not really being tr very transparent about who comes to see them about issues and what the topics are. In some ways, it's almost as bad as, as Cheney on the um, National Energy Task Force. Well, and Patrice's point about you know, saying who are called lobbyists is really the key here. Corporate CEOs are free to talk about these right. issues to members of the government, but the registered lobbyist is not entitled to talk about it. That's not really what the... the right. It doesn't get to the heart of the issue. The truth is, in order to get rid of the influence of money and special interests in Washington, we need to have disclosure about who is talking about what and what their connections are. That's right. why access to information about who's visiting the White House to talk right. about health care is exactly the kind of thing that the public needs to know, because that's where you begin to understand who the interests are who are right. talking to our leaders. And it was only after crew filed litigation that they relented. All right, we're almost out of time. Right. So. Um, both of you, give me your uh, short uh, list of what should be done uh, in order to get the Obama administration up to an, at least an A minus. Up to an A minus. <laughs> um, but good implementation of the Open Government Act and, and better FOIA practices, um, rein in overclassification and rein in sensitive but unclassified categories. I would agree with what Patrice said. <laughs> I'm extremely optimistic, frankly, because every person who I speak to in the administration seems to be coming at the issues with a great deal of concern about transparency. So I think that if they can get their classification 
in order and they actually start doing better on FOIA releases, then I think that they're going to be a big success. And I, I will add, we didn't talk about their open government process, no. but they are trying to very successfully collaborate with the public and talk to the public in a new way. And that, to me, is a tremendous advance. Sort of successfully. <laughs> 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 well, many thanks to the Meredith Fuchs of the National Security Archive and Patrice McDermott of OpenTheGovernment.org for your balanced transparency report card for the early days of the Obama administration and for keeping the administration's feet to the fire on its promise to reverse the policies of the secretive Bush administration. When we return, if you knew that American soldiers in Iraq lacked adequate protective vehicles resulting in needless death, would you have blown the whistle? Franz Geil did. Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. Did the Marine Corps' tardiness in deploying blast-resistant armored vehicles result in hundreds of Marines needlessly dying in Iraq? That was the finding of a civilian scientist employed by the Marines, a retired Marine himself. But when Franz Geil issued his report, he was ordered to cease any further work on the study by the Marine Corps. And I should say that you are here today in your individual capacity, not here representing either the Marine Corps or the civilian uh, agency that you work for. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Well, welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. Um, tell me a little bit about your background. How did you get to the Marine Corps to begin with? Well, I, uh, when I was uh, 16. I had actually dropped out of high school. Back where were in you? Minnesota. I was in Minnesota. That's where mm -hmm. I grew up in mm -hmm. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd uh, dropped out of high school, and uh, uh, in 1974, and uh, I had the mm -hmm. good fortune of meeting a Marine recruiter. And uh, so on my 17th birthday, I joined the Marine Corps, and uh, it's changed my life ever since. And I'm Marine to this very day. Uh, I enlisted, became uh, first went to in the infantry, mm -hmm. and then subsequently I became a Marine security guard. Those are mm -hmm. embassy guards. And when you left the Marine Corps five years later, what was your rank? I was a sergeant. Okay, and then I, what did you I do? A I worked in Germany for some time as I'm a dual citizen, uh, as I, I was a bodyguard for mm -hmm. the chairman of the board of a uh, of the Robert Bosch Corporation in in Stuttgart, in the vicinity of Stuttgart. Did that for a little over a year, a year and a half, and then I came back to the United States and went to the University of Minnesota on Under the GI Bill. GI Bill, and you got a degree in? I got a degree in political science, and uh, and I missed the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So uh, what did you do? I uh, went down to the uh, uh, the officer, selection officer, and uh, 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 ended up going to officer candidate school. Mm -hmm. And I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the, in the Marine Corps. That was in 1983. And uh, after a little delayed entry, uh, 1984, I, I was back in uniform. Um, and I became an infantry officer at that point. Mm -hmm. I had uh, been in the infantry beforehand when I was enlisted and wanted to do that again. And you stayed in until when? I stayed in until uh, uh, to the rank of major, and I retired after total 22 years of active service in in 2002. And but you stayed connected to the Marine Corps even after you left the Corps. Yes, I mean, yeah, I I, I didn't I didn't want to leave the Marine Corps. I I never never uh, want to leave the Marine Corps, and uh, but I got to the point where I couldn't get promoted anymore, 
as a major, beyond major. And so I became a civil servant. I was mm -hmm. hired back as a civil servant. And because I had been to graduate school in Monterey, California at Naval Postgraduate School, I had some skills that qualified me to be uh, a science advisor, science and technology advisor. So mm -hmm. I was hired back uh, with that as being one of my primary functions mm -hmm. at Headquarters Marine Corps. All right. Now let's fast forward to uh, 2005, I believe. Um, and you were uh, working on a study um, about uh, armored resistant vehicles. No, no, not, uh, not in 2005. Okay. 2005, I was uh, doing many other varied things right. at Headquarters Marine Corps uh, as, a, uh, as a science and technology advisor, uh, looking at many advanced technologies for, that might have utility Mm -hmm. in the conflict we were in. Uh, in 2006, or in 2005 to 2006, I was sent to school, another graduate school, mm -hmm. the National Defense University. And upon graduating from there, uh, I returned to my Pentagon position. And it was around that time that I was invited by the commanding general of Marine Forces in western Iraq, in Al Anbar province, Let's, let's let's move back a little bit. You, you know, we're talking about now 2007. We're talking 2006 now. 2006. Okay, and we're in 2006. And what is your position at that time? I'm still the uh, I'm, again the science and technology advisor. Uh, is one of my main functions at uh, headquarters Marine Corps to one of the deputy commandants. Okay, the, it's called the deputy commandant for plans, policies, and operations. And so you were saying you were contacted by. I was contacted by uh, one of my previous supervisors from years past, uh, who was now the commanding general in Western Iraq, uh, multinational forces West (MNFW) we call it, and that was in the during the difficult period in Al Anbar Province, where we were suffering many many casualties from various. It's just a tough time, and you probably remember that from the press. And uh, I was asked if I wanted to come over and assist with some of the, we'll call it bureaucratic challenges, um, because there, were, there was obviously equipment that was needed by the Marines over there that they were not receiving. And equipment that had been requested through the bureaucracy in the, in the rear, but they weren't getting it. There were the various systems that, that I was aware of, some of them in, in mature, some of them being developed that uh, would potentially mitigate many of the casualties and the circumstances that the Marines were running into over there. All right, well, let's talk about one. This is something called an MRAP. What is that and what does it do? The MRAP is uh, an acronym for the Mine Resistant Ambush Protected Vehicle. It's a mouthful. It's a big armored truck. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's nothing new. It's, uh, it's a design, uh, a vehicle concept, and a design, and a product, and products that have been uh, first developed actually earlier in the 20th century, but primarily later in, uh, the, uh, in the Bush Wars mm -hmm. in South Africa. And what's it used for? For working in an irregular warfare environment where bombs, improvised bombs, improvised explosive devices are used as a weapon of choice, especially by an, uh, an, an enemy force that is, is outmatched in numbers and perhaps technologies. Improvised bombs are very effective against, against vehicles. So what's the difference between an MRAP and a Humvee in terms of their ability to withstand some kind of roadside bomb attack? Well, in terms of, in terms of just that protective quality, I mean, the, the MRAP is, is far superior. It was designed for that purpose. Mm -hmm. It was tailored, uh, tailored design from the ground up with a, what we call a V-hull, disperses blast. It's a little bit higher off the ground, so the blast is already uh, dispersed a little bit by the time it reaches the vehicle. It's got, uh, it has its modular parts that kind of falls apart, but it protects the crew inside, and you can easily reassemble these things. Uh, uh, if they've been taken back to the depot. And what you wrote in your report is that had there been these MRAPs in place rather than the Humvees, that hundreds of deaths could have been avoided. Yes, and actually long before I wrote that report, I, as I said, I went to Iraq, I saw the issues, and 
I did not, it wasn't me who came up with the idea that there was a problem. Mm -hmm. Other Marines, uh, commanders that uh, I was either working for or the staff that I was working with brought all these issues to my attention. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not something I invented out of thin air. And there had been Marines who had studied the issue of armor in years past and done papers and, and theses on this. I was just introduced to the topic. All right. Well, now, with all of this support from other Marines who mm -hmm. were expert in this area, I assume that when the request got back to Quantico that they said, sure, let's do that. Well, no, no, they didn't. And uh, there are many reasons for this, and I guess this gets to the whole psychology of bureaucracy. Um, but obviously, uh, to, when you have already purchased one system, let's say the Humvee, and you have, uh, you have a very cost-effective contract and, uh, and, and a whole business case built up, and everything is moving, and you've got these things, you're producing them and pumping them out, and, 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 and a very stable program. It has only so much money, and now you get a request for something that is unknown that is essentially not invented here is what we use the term, that will compete against those resources. Well, the, the business case is, is in jeopardy. And that money would have to be taken away from uh, existing programs and applied to something new that's being asked for, something completely foreign. So I get it. So the Marine Corps brass was saying, well, look, this is an unknown. It's going to cost us money. We have something in place. We're sticking with what we got. Uh, what did, and so what did they do with your report? What did they do to you? Well, again, this is all prior to the report. These things that I'm describing mm -hmm. here happened uh, even partially before I ever went to Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, the report just happened to be the pinnacle of when I was starting to report on it right. uh, officially. Um, that came later. It's the brass is our Marines in uniform, general officers. And, you know, I love my Marine Corps, and they're my brothers and my sisters. And I don't think any Marine uh, would, would consciously make a decision that would, would be contrary to the best interests of the, of the Marines in the field. But what happens is, is back here in the, in the what we call CONUS, continental United States and the support establishment and the bureaucracy, what we often identify as the Pentagon, is that we have a civilian infrastructure underlying that, that often has a completely different set of priorities, of incentives, uh, that by the very nature of being a civilian bureaucracy uh, may have objectives and incentives that are, that are in contradiction with the best interests of the Marines, the uniformed Marines in the field. That's just the psychology of the, of the bureaucracy, and, and it's... it's, it's uh, well, it's, let's, let's, let's move forward to the report being issued. To call it the evidence that I had, that I had available to me, uh, was compelling enough for certain people in Congress, certain members of Congress, um, uh, to ask for the Inspector General to take a closer look. And so, as a consequence of my reports, these inspector general audits were conducted, one on the MRAP and one on another weapon system that, uh, that I can talk about later. So that's the real outcome of that, is, is gaining visibility, bringing it into the light to see, okay, how did this happen? And that was one of my main objectives. In terms of getting the armor moving uh, to Iraq, that had happened already beforehand. Uh, Secretary Gates became... So it was this process you were talking about. Uh, up until the report time where feedback was coming in that this exactly. is really what we need. Exactly. I mean, uh, it became clear, and, and our, our good Secretary of Defense made it crystal clear to, to the services uh, that, uh, and especially in the case of MRAP, he made it one of his top priorities. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it was the number one priority program for a period of time at the so, Pentagon. So you're now, you must be treated as a hero at, uh, for, for having brought this forward, is that right? Well. No. <laughs> it's, I went outside the family. And I'm not, you know, again, I'm not, I'm, I am one of many. I'm just the point, I'm, I'm, I'm the visible aspect of this. There are many, many Marines behind me. I think it's convenient for me to represent the issue publicly because I'm better protected than the Marine in uniform. 
there are so many Marines behind me that have brought the issues to my attention that are much more vulnerable than me. Nonetheless, what happened to you? Okay, well, in, in my case, yeah, it wasn't well received. I think the leadership in the Marine Corps, first of all, I'm a Marine, and I, I went outside the family to get visibility on the subject to get some of the problems solved. And, and I understand my family, and, and that is it's a, some, it's the last thing a person wants to do. Uh, I never dreamed of being a whistleblower, and it's the last thing I'd want to do. It's, it's, it's kind of contrary to our, 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 our concept of loyalty. But at the same time, you've got to say things when, when it's important enough. Well, I'd gone outside the family, and there were probably many thought that he didn't need to do it that way. There, he could have come to us. He could have done it differently. Well, it wasn't realized that I had attempted all those, those avenues, and they, they, were, they were denied to me. So um, the response was more of an, uh, uh, an automated response. He's not obeying our instructions. <laughs> he's, uh, he's gone off the reservation, as we often say. Uh, and we've got to stop him from doing that. How did they do that? Well, the first step was, and I, say, I have to say that this is largely driven by civilian bureaucrats in my organization, and not so much by the, the officers themselves. Uh, but the officers are the signatories to various uh, you know, reprisals and punishments, and so that's, that's what they take on board. But first thing, uh, formal counseling in writing from my, one of my civilian supervisors and a military supervisor right over me. Okay, so, well, that wasn't effective because I was still convinced that these issues needed to be discussed and aired, and uh, a couple kind uh, members of Congress came to my assistance, and uh, the press took an interest in the, in, in the issue. And because I was having my ability to contact the chain of command through the Pentagon or anywhere else kind of capped by my own organization. Well, then I continued my communications uh, with, with uh, staffers and, uh, and, and on occasion the press. Then came a formal reprimand. This is a more informal. <laughs> when did this uh, happen? Uh, it was in mid-2007. Okay. This is, I've already been home maybe six months. And what did the reprimand say? The exact words were, uh, I've, it came down to failing to follow the instructions and the directions that were given to me. Don't do this. In this case, it was contacting Congress without prior approval or something related to that. And, and I, now today I understand because of the kind assistance and advice that you know, the GAP has given me. Um, I know that I was within my rights. But at the time, I really didn't care whether I was in my rights or not. That wasn't the point. That wasn't the issue. I wasn't worried about my rights or what happens to me if I'm going to get hit over the head for doing this. The issue was getting, getting the bureaucracy fixed. They couldn't allow something like this to happen again. Because yes, many, many Marines uh, probably uh, lost their lives or were maimed when they didn't need to be because there, was, there were knowing decisions made that allowed that to happen. And I, I just didn't think that was right. This has, a, this has an impact on future conflicts. So, official reprimand. So I can you know, continue to be my off the reservation self, I guess. And uh, then came the proposal to suspend me. And I, I approached the Office of Special Counsel on a few occasions, but my and for the same reason. For the same reason, all the same stuff. Follow all the same stuff. And uh, eventually, I, I think I contacted you guys and, and, and that government would be the government accountability that project. Government accountability project, and you guys have been wonderful. Um, you know, I, I really don't believe I would have my job today uh, if it, if it wasn't for you. But yet, you're an outsider. You're outsiders. You're outside the system. It would be nice to know that I, you know, that in the future, if someone has stands in my shoes and sees the things that I've seen. Uh, could relatively safely bring these issues up, even if it makes other people uncomfortable, without getting punished for it. Well, let's, and, and I appreciate that. What is your current legal status? My current legal status, well, let's see. After my proposal for suspension, uh, then came some other uh, interesting things. Uh, I've, my most recent punishment was a uh, performance, improval, performance improvement program. I think uh, nicknamed a PIP. Well, that's usually <laughs> what 
civil servants get right about before they're before they're about to get fired. And it's, saying, it's establishing a record of bad performance exactly. for purposes of taking a and I, and I personnel action. And I have quite a record of bad performance now in my file. And, uh, and, and, and whether or not, I, you know, I'm, I'm willing to accept that. I can live with that, you know, as long as the problems get fixed. Because I want to remain focused on the issues. I'm, I still feel very lucky to have the job that I do. And I, you know, I'm honored to be able to still be in the Marine Corps. But I don't think this should have happened. And I don't think I should be punished for doing something I think is right. Well, I'm on an extension, supposedly I'm on an extension of this performance improvement program, this PIP. Uh, I probably am to the, I'm probably not performing as I was told on my most recent counseling, I'm not performing at all to the expectations of the PIP and uh, that I, but I've been given a little bit of extra time to improve myself somehow and, and that's fine. I, you know, I will, will. Has there been any change at all in how you've been treated of late? Yes. Um, I can only put it this way. And again, it's unique to the military. The civilian bureaucracy stays in place. The officers above that bureaucracy, they come and they go. And they're refreshed over time. And the Marine Corps kind of moves on. That's one wonderful thing. And with the exception of some intense difficulties that I still have with the civilian bureaucrats that I deal with that are immediately over me, as well as my history of difficulty with the bureaucracy that I, that I addressed in the first place. I don't know. I, I, I have a new feeling now, and it's only because I was able to stay there because of your support and then some members of Congress that I'm still here. But only because you allowed me to survive this long, I think the Marine Corps is getting over it. I think any Marine would have done exactly the same thing, even these, whether they be a high-ranking general or another mar Marines of, 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 of lower rank, would do exactly the same thing that I did, having been in my shoes and having made my observations. Well, I like, and I think they know that themselves. I like to believe that's true. I'm not so sure that it is true, and, but it does answer, I think, probably my last question. Knowing now, having been put through the ringer for having done this, knowing now, um, what happens to people who uh, take a stand like you did, would you have done it again? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a Marine. I mean, we have to, you know, this is my family, and I recognize a, 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 a great danger, a great threat to my family, uh, now and in the future, and to absolutely do the same thing. Um, getting beat up over it, well, that's just that's part of the price. So. Well, many thanks to Franz Geil for standing up for the safety of American troops. Uh, well, Pentagon officials tried to fend off Geil's criticism by wrapping themselves in patriotic cloaks. It seems they were also wrapping American troops in flag draped caskets. I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Whistle Where You Work. Mm -hmm.